I've got a question for you. Are you a treasure hunter? Our text this morning is Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this morning. We pray that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, and open our ears to hear, see, and do your word. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I was looking at this photograph right here of several people laughing in a ballroom in the British Embassy in Sofia, Bulgaria in the 1920s. Just a simple room in a building full of people, but if you had the sophistication to see beyond the obvious, to see that which is hidden, you could see that this place was a tiny tip of the great iceberg that was the gigantic British Empire, an empire whose king at that time ruled over all the world's oceans and whose domains included vast tracts of land and hundreds of millions of subjects on every continent of the earth. Friends, we need to train our eyes to see that which is hidden, to seek hidden treasure. This morning in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus will instruct us about hunting holy hidden treasure. Hunting holy hidden treasure. Go ahead and open up your Bibles. Luke chapter 15, we're going to begin in verse 1. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. And it says there in verse 1, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. Now in context here, we've seen that Jesus was just at a feast, a meal that he had eaten with Pharisees and lawyers, among whom tax collectors and sinners would never be welcome. Tax collectors and sinners were filthy. Tax collectors and sinners were no good than dogs. Tax collectors and sinners were unclean who could not come into such a feast. But you might have this question. What is it about tax collectors and sinners in the first century? Who are these people and why do the Pharisees and scribes dislike them so much? Tax collectors. Does anyone in here like the IRS? Anybody want to raise their hand and say, I'm really excited about the 87,000 new agents they're hiring. Maybe they'll come and give me an audit. Wouldn't that be great? It's more than that. It's more than that in the first century. Imagine if China were occupying this country and the IRS collected the taxes for China and the IRS agent could arbitrarily charge whatever he wanted. So they're taking the money out of the country for a foreign power. They were hated because of this, but there's more. You see, ordinarily, the people they used when they collected taxes in the regions that they were in, for example, in Judea and Galilee in the first century, is they would get some local to do that because they knew the lay of the land. They knew how the people thought. They knew where the people were hiding their property that needed to be taxed. And so you would have a Jew who would sign up with the Roman authorities, and he would collect the taxes for the Romans, these occupying Gentiles in the Promised Land, and then the tax collector himself could arbitrarily give himself an extra fee. And if he didn't like you, he could charge a rather large fee. And so they were hated. They were associated with the Gentile overlords who were in the land of promise. What about sinners? Who are these people? Sinners is a catch-all phrase for those hated by the Pharisees for real or imagined sins. Some of them were people that needed to be cast out of the body of the people of God in the first century. But some of them were doing things that went against the traditions of the scribes and Pharisees and didn't exactly go against the word of God itself. And so, these people, tax collectors and sinners, are those who don't fall under the rubric of the followers of the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees, and they're hated. But here they come again. Here they come again to Jesus. They're drawing near to Jesus. Back in Luke chapter 7 and verse 34, it says, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Before we get to chapter 15, Jesus has gotten a reputation of being friendly toward and welcoming toward tax collectors and sinners, so much so that the scribes and Pharisees actually mock him for this. Now, what is it about this? You guys probably see the, the it looks like a cigar store Jesus statue, you know, where he's like going like that, right? You guys have seen that picture. People put it in memes all the time. We've got this idea that Jesus is cool with anything we do. 
Yeah, man. All right, that must be some good weed. Keep doing what you're doing. Jesus isn't so much a friend of sinners. He isn't down with your sin as he is a rescuer of sinners. And as a rescuer of sinners, his arms are wide open. And all these sinners and tax collectors are repenting of their sins. And they're drawing near to Jesus. And they want to hear what Jesus has to say. Because they know they're sinners. They know they're not right with God. And they want someone to teach them and tell them how to be right with God. And Jesus is doing that. But the scribes and Pharisees don't want to hear it. They want to keep people out and far away. Verse 2 in chapter 15. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. The Pharisees and the scribes here in the Greek, here's the Greek verb there for what they're doing. It's dia gaguzo. Dia gaguzo means grumbling, but not just grumbling. It's the grumbling of endless grumblers. They will never stop grumbling. They're always going to have a problem with Jesus because... Their teachings don't line up with Jesus and what he says. John the Baptist was on friendly speaking terms with tax collectors, and you may notice there seems to be a means of playing Jesus off against John the Baptist and the Pharisees after John's exited the scene with his death. John seems to be more like them, and so they start playing John off against Jesus. But John the Baptist was on friendly speaking terms with tax collectors in Luke chapter 3. Jesus feasted with Levi and his tax collector friends in Luke 5, and the scribes and Pharisees, Diagaguzor, they grumbled against us. In Luke 7, Jesus declared John the Baptist a great forerunner of the kingdom, and then this happened? Luke chapter 7, verse 29. Kids, listen to this. You may not know this. It's kind of interesting. It says, when all the people had heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. So the people are drawing near. We're told that all Israel is going down and listening to the words of John the Baptist, and the people are being cut to the quick, and they're being baptized in preparation for the coming of Messiah. And then there's this in verse 30 of chapter 7. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Yeah, they came down. They came down to the river. They came down to the river to test John the Baptist. They came down to the river to test this man acclaimed by John as Messiah. The scribes and Pharisees are always, always saying, but, 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 never willing to submit, never willing to believe, never willing to take the sign of the kingdom and its arrival and baptism. They were not baptized by him. The tax collectors and sinners are anything but treasure to the Pharisees and the scribes. Let's go on to verse 3 here. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Now, notice this, friends. Jesus here appears to condescend to the Pharisees and scribes and allows that they are shepherds of Israel. Indeed, they are. In fact, the priesthood at the time of Jesus is completely out of order with the law of God, and yet Jesus condescends to that system, allows himself to be tried by that system. In fact, the high priest who is not properly in the place of the high priest, doesn't have the proper lineage, is placed there really in reality by the authority of the Romans, tries Jesus and executes Jesus as the high priest. And yet in the grand providence of God, it is in order. Jesus condescends to the Pharisees and the scribes and allows that they are shepherds of Israel, but they've done a poor job. Jesus here, I believe, through his parable, is trying to convict and maybe even convince some of these shepherds that they must act like shepherds, true shepherds. The shepherd that's true leaves the 99 because they are not lost, or at least they don't think they're lost. They hang together with the flock. We don't know what the state of the mind is of the one sheep, but we're told it's lost. Any of you guys have herds of sheep at your house? I know some of you might have it on your property. And you'll see sometimes there's a sheep, there's that one sheep that just wants to go on its own. It just will not hang with the flock. And so you're taking the flock along, and this one sees something over there, or 
sees something it wants to eat or drink and goes off all by itself. And now it's all alone in a dangerous country. No one to protect the sheep. But the shepherd goes out, leaving the 99, looking for that one sheep that is lost. The shepherd is focused on the one sheep that is definitely lost. The shepherd, the true shepherd of souls, is focused on the one sheep that is lost. Think about that for a minute, friends. Watch how the rest of this unpacks. See the love of God. See the concern of Jesus for the lost sinner. Going on to verse 5. And when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Notice what the shepherd does. He goes to look for the one sheep. He finds the lost sheep. And then he, chiron, chiron, that's the verb there, chiron. It's presented here in a, as a present active participle. He rejoices, he rejoices to find the lost sheep. That makes sense so far, doesn't it? If you've lost an animal, you know, you got a herd of pot-bellied pigs or something, I don't know, I suppose somebody has that. And your, your one pig disappears, the other 99, you got them all penned up. You go out looking for it, and you're out walking around the hills, and you come around a rock. There it is! You grab it and put it on your shoulders, and you come home. You're happy about that, right? But now things get kind of a little strange. He calls all he knows and says, Sun kairete moi. It's an aorist passive imperative. An imperative is a command, a command. What this shepherd is saying is, You must all rejoice with me. Now, in an agricultural society like this, where you've got sheep all over the place and you've got shepherds and they're not considered on the highest tier of society. A shepherd goes out and finds the lost sheep, comes back to his village and calls everybody together and says, you must rejoice with me, would be crazy. I think that's the point of this. It's way above and beyond. The shepherd rejoices finding that one sheep. And then he wants everybody to rejoice with him. All this joy for a little lost sheep, it seems a bit overdone, does it not? As though the shepherd had found hidden treasure. Hidden treasure, kids. Going on to verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. There will be more kara, that's joy, in heaven over one sinner who repents. This is the lost sheep now let that sink in for a minute. Heaven itself rejoices over the lost sinner who turns as though hidden treasure has been found. Then over the 99 who need no repentance, that's metanoia there, means a change of mind or a change to the inner man. And we see that the sinners and we see that the tax collectors are drawing near and the state of mind of them is metanoia. They are repenting. They're changing their mind. They're changing in their inner man. They want to draw near to Jesus while the scribes and Pharisees are trying to have Jesus killed. Rejoicing. Look at that. More joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. But the Pharisees and the scribes, they grumble. Verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Here we've got a coin this time. We don't have a sheep. In some ways, even more of a small thing. You got to remember in the first century that having flocks and animals is actual money. You can barter it. A sheep's worth more than this, this coin. The woman had 10 coins, but she lost one, and all of her focus is on this one lost coin. And look how she found the coin. How did she find the coin, kids? She used light. She used the light. She uses the light and diligently looks for the lost coin and finds it. And then she does something surprising. You're right, that's a small coin. I would estimate in today's value that coin might be about $10. Can you imagine if you have 100 bucks in your wallet, you know? For a lot of us, it's not a big deal, but if you're a poor person today, 100 bucks might mean something, right? And you lose a $10 bill. It's consequential, but it's not huge. 
Can you imagine somebody living in an apartment complex down in the city, and they lose a $10 bill, and they find it, and they go knocking on everybody's door and going, rejoice with me, I found my $10 bill. Wouldn't it be ridiculous? I think that's the point. It wouldn't have been such an amazing thing in the first century. It's above and beyond. It's way out of proportion. She goes and tells everyone that she knows to come and celebrate with her. And you see, that's the point. That's the point of it. Look at verse 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Notice that both the sheep and the coin have value. Sinners aren't valueless, but they are lost. We are made in the image of God, but we are turned into trash. We are flesh and bones meant to live forever, and yet because of the fall, we are destined to die, and yet God loves us. And he goes out looking not really for a coin, or going out looking for a, a sheep, but he goes out looking on the trash heap, the trash heap of humanity. And he brings us in, cleans us up, and in the blood of Christ, he gives us new life and prepares us for eternity. The veil is lifted here. We see something. I don't think we should make too little of this. We see what heaven is like. We're told here there's rejoicing in heaven when we look at verse 7, and then we get down here, down to verse 9, and things get a little bit larger and larger, and then in verse 10 we see that there's joy with the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Heaven rejoices and the angels rejoice over one sinner who repents. One higher, upper class, middle class person who repents, the angels of heaven rejoice. If that woman who's begging for change down there, who's only 35 years old, but she looks like she's going on 70, and maybe you remember her from high school because she was out there smoking pot all the time, never wanted to get her life straight, and you're thinking in your mind, she deserves this. And yet Jesus goes out looking for people like that. Saves them. Uses means, too. He uses you and I call the lost. And for trash like us, the angels of heaven rejoice. I don't know how they do it. There's probably going to be 100, 200,000 people saved all over the world this morning just during our time at the service. And the angels are rejoicing. They're rejoicing. And this age progresses and more and more are coming in and the angels are rejoicing and rejoicing. If the heavens and the angels of heaven rejoice over hidden treasure, how important is it a task to seek it? If heaven and the angels rejoice over hidden treasure, how important of a task is it to find it? When a single crab is put into a bucket, it can figure out a way to escape. But when there are more than one in a bucket, none of them can get out because they're incapable of waiting and seeing things aright, and they spend their time impatiently always trying to elevate themselves so that none of them can escape. Likewise, the Pharisees spent their time clambering over one another and elevating themselves over others so they couldn't see what was important to God. In reality, their blindness kept them from seeing hidden treasure and escaping from God's judgment. In the end, those they despise will get into the kingdom and they'll be left in the bucket of judgment on the outside. This morning, we've seen in the Gospel of Luke that God is hunting for treasure and that he is making us treasure hunters who are hunting holy, hidden treasure. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us to thank you for hunting us, hunting us and saving us. We pray that you would help us and make us into hunters of hidden treasure, hidden holy treasure. Bless us even this week to carry out this task, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.